Greetings, my name is Roberto Valdez, a Master of the Science of Geography and Instructor of History at Northern New Mexico College in Española, New Mexico. Pueblo II is a dissemination period for the Anasazi that I want to speak to you about today, an ancient Indian people in the American Southwest, El Norte Mexicano. The early part of this time has been described as a developmental period. They make cultural advances, they spread their cultural seeds around, and this is why you can think of this time period as a dissemination period. They developed uh, societies of regional influence and, uh, and culture, and then climate and other internal problems wrecked it. In this presentation, we will favor a discussion concerning the Chaco culture in the San Juan Basin, but also the Mesa Verde, the Hovenweep, the Cayenta, and other cultures as well to try to give you some comprehension of the historical geography of the time in the region. The Chaco Anasazi developed a complex of structures mostly in the canyon bottoms of the San Juan Basin of today's New Mexico and they had a network of trade and pilgrimage routes. These people had a ruling elite and had some astounding religious practices. For your learning objectives, I want you to understand why this time period may be described for this people as classic and located in basin regions. This time period is the classic period because it's considered to be an outstanding and remarkable time when the culture is of high quality. I want you to be able to describe some distinctive uh, architectural advancements and achievements of the Anasazi. You might recall the Chaco Anasazi had great houses, great kivas, and distinctive masonry from a prior lesson. We'll cover that again. I want you to identify some celestial and geographic events that they paid attention to. The Anasazi recorded them as rock art. Uh, scholars have been able to identify dates, or, or at least um, the year that the events occurred, uh, and according to the way we keep time today. As a consequence, I want you to learn these datable events so that we can see what the Anasazi witnessed and what other people in other places wrote about. I want you to become uh, more familiar with Pueblo II Chaco culture artistic expression and crafts and their influence through this network they operated for their religious practices and trade. I want you to explain how great kivas, calendars, rituals, and pilgrimage became highly important in the religion of Pueblo II cultures, especially with the Chaco culture. And that applies to our final point. I want you to know about darker occurrences that appeared among the Anasazi of the Pueblo II period uh, in the region and how it led to changes that created the Pueblo III period, which progressed and changed into upland areas. For a moment, uh, let's use the Google Earth mapping service to show you an overlay that I made pointing out the different locations of the great houses of the Chaco people and how they're situated with each other. We first have to zoom into the San Juan Basin in the northwest of the state of New Mexico. The main complex is centered around Chaco Canyon, which you can see here. It uh, is bracketed by Pueblo Pintado at the east. There you can see the ruins of the great house. And on the west is Kin Beniola. Now at the very heart of the complex is Pueblo Bonito. It's a large D-shaped Pueblo covering over three acres. If we pull out in this view, you can see that there are other great house ruins nearby. There's Chetroquetl, Pueblo del Arroyo, King Kletso, Pueblo Alto, Hongo Pavi, Una Vida, Uijiji, and finally, Peñasco Blanco. Remember Peñasco Blanco. It's a Spanish word for white rock or boulder and forms the west end of the central density of uh, Chaco and Great House ruins. Let's also fly into a prominent butte called Fajada Butte. It's southeast of Pueblo Bonito and closer to the Una Vida Great House ruin. Both Pueblo Peñasco, or I should say Peñasco Blanco, and uh, Fajada Butte will be, well, they'll come up again when we discuss the astronomical observations of the Chaco people. The name Chaco is a misspelling of the Spanish name Cañón del Charco, Cañón del Charco, meaning canyon of the pool or waterhole. 
In 1849, an expedition into the land of the Navajo was led by U.S. Army Lieutenant Colonel James H. Simpson. The expedition was guided by a Hispanic informant named Carabajal from the town of San Isidro who provided many of the names for the Chacoan great houses. Unfortunately, some of them and the name for the canyon itself were mispronounced and misspelled by the journalist. He recorded Charco as Chaco and the great house ruin of Chetroquitl was likely a New Mexico Spanish dialectical word Chipichipe. Chipichipe. And that word means fine rain. Therefore, the rangers there, they call that Pueblo the Rain Pueblo uh, because they received fragments of information from the literature. A uh, later U.S. Army map dated 1864 revealed the correct name for the canyon, but the mistake name is already well entrenched. Let's go through the basics of who and what this culture has been identified as in uh, scholarly publications. I want you to remember that they are an Anasazi culture, one of several cultures that developed Pueblo ar architecture, uh, pottery, and a trade network in the U.S. Southwest El Norte Mexicano. Shown on this map are the road networks interconnecting the great house complexes of the, of the Chaco culture throughout the region of the San Juan Basin and how it relates to the four corner states of New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, and Colorado. The Chaco Canyon cultural region experienced an increase in their population and their, uh, and their cultural change had accelerated. Chaco Canyon itself was a major pilgrimage site. The people of the Chaco culture were involved with astronomy. Um, uh, they observed and recorded four celestial events in AD 1054, 1066, 1076, and 1097. Uh, and we'll identify uh, these years better later on in this presentation. I want you to remember that the Chaco culture is an Anasazi culture distinguished by its great houses, great kivas, and distinctive masonry. So let me give you an example uh, of that time span that the Chaco Anasazi operated in to build the great Pueblo of Pueblo Bonito, shown herein. This place still had its ancient roof beams called vigas. Researchers used them to extract dates, finding that it was built from between the years AD 828 to 1126. The culture went into decline after the year AD 1140 due to droughts and some kind of unrest and warfare. These people were obsessed with grandiose and extravagant things from pottery to jewelry to the obvious thing you see here, the size of their pueblos. This is also known as megalomania. And it's believed uh, that one of the main purposes of overbuilding was part of the expression of power by an elite over a large number of people who came here on pilgrimage and were drawn in by the religion. A large workforce ruled by the elite created the grandiose architecture as part of that religion and it was overbuilt to impress the, the pilgrims. These uh, great houses were so massive and the climate so dry that many of the roofing materials that were, uh, that were found were well preserved enough. The rooms are rectangular employing these wooden beams like I said called vigas. The innermost rooms were often found intact by archaeologists, such as at Pueblo Bonito. The great houses are characteristically multi-storied, that is to say they are three and four stories in height. Since many of them were developed over a period of hundreds of years, the Chaco Anasazi added to them, while others show signs of being built in a short period of time, according to some kind of plan. And they had a great kiva, either inside their plazas or outside and nearby. The purpose of these great houses was revealed much later. Scholars found the pattern to this puzzle. After all, why would this culture invest so much time and effort into all of this? Again, it had to do with religion and a ruling elite. In general, during the Pueblo II period, religion grew complex. Great kivas were quite a large size to accommodate communal gatherings for ceremonies. One curiosity within the Chaco Canyon complex is Casa Rinconada. Casa Rinconada. 
Not only is it 64 feet in diameter and the largest of the great kivas, it's curious because it's situated on a hill some distance away from the great houses and uh, those windows and niches that you see around in the, on the inside wall were part of uh, ceremonies related to the calendar. So let me show you some detail on that. Here is the floor plan of Casa Rinconada. Its windows and niches were aligned according to cardinals and solstices. Cardinals refers to directions such as north, west, south, and east. Uh, solstices refers to the alignment of the sun during extremes of summer and winter. In other words, this round structure has features in it that are aimed to the north, the west, uh, the south, and the east, as well as features that use light and shadow to tell you what time of the year that you're in. This great kiva is partly underground and built of rock. On the center floor were four main wooden pillars uh, labeled here uh, A, uh, B, C, and D. And these ones held up the roof. They were large wooden pillars made of rock or more likely uh, vigas or large beams of trees. They perfect the orientation to the four directions. Inside uh, the inner walls were these windows and uh, these indentations called niches such as F and E and D and C shown here. They are sunk into the masonry walls at intervals and researchers found that the windows let in sunlight on certain days of the year and they shine at a given niche. Perhaps there was some kind of idol or symbol that was lit up uh, signaling the arrival of an, of an important event. Now let's give you a close-up view of some of the other great houses in uh, Chaco Canyon. On the left is an example of the kind of window and door openings created using native rock as masonry and pine beams as lintels above the windows. As I pointed out before, Chetroquetl is identified as the Rain Pueblo by the National Park Inter Informational Brochures and Booklets, but it was probably taken from the Nuevo Mexicano word Chipi Chipi, meaning fine rain. Shown in the photograph at the lower left is uh, Pueblo del Arroyo, and that one features an unusual kiva having three concentric walls. Below that um, is, uh, or I should say uh, to, uh, to the uh, right of me, is a great house called Kin Kletso, which is a name derived from the Navajo language meaning yellow house. Yellow house, Kin Kletso. Some of the great houses in the region are named in the Navajo language. Navajo arrived much later in time, but they marveled at these abandoned great houses and they named some of them. King Kletso is a very uh, rectangular um, structure and it's built at the base of a cliff with kivas that are within it that almost appear like towers within the structure. The people of Chaco practiced an Anasazi culture uh, known for its distinctive masonry. And that developed over time as materials and expertise dictated changes in the styling. Shown in the, on the photograph, on the right is the back wall of Pueblo Bonito that reaches in some places four and five stories in height. To do this correctly, they made the walls wide at the bottom and gently tapering them narrower and narrower towards the top. As the Pueblo is developed over time, some of the rooms in the lower stories were filled in with debris and the lower walls bulked up to support the massive weight above. Below is an illustration of the different types of masonry found at the great houses that are associated with the Chaco culture. It was determined that five general categories developed. The first four reflect the Chaco culture, however, and the fifth one labeled Mekelmo appears like that used by their neighbors to the north, the Mesa Verde Anasazi people. Now, uh, paying attention to the photographs uh, on the extreme left, uh, we're going to review some of the types that were used. So type 1 is simple. The walls are one stone thick with lots of mortar in between. And the oldest walls in Pueblo Bonito dating from uh, AD 860 to the late 900s were using a uh, type 1 building method. Uh, the example at left is found in an inner room called room 33 at Pueblo Bonito. 
uh, keep that in the back of your mind because I'm going to talk about that special room some more. Uh, when the Chaco Anasazi built higher walls with a thick inner core of rubble, they used a veneer of facing stone and tapered it narrower upwards towards the upper stories. And this is type 2 where they used large tablets of sandstone and in between them uh, they were chinking tiny tablets with mud. This is the type used in the classic times um, of uh, AD uh, 1020 to 1120. About half of the ground floor rooms of the Pueblo Bonito were built using type 3 and type 4 masonry. See? Again? So, um, actually I went too far. Let me go back. There we go. All right. That's type four. Um, so the, this type, this style was overlapping when they were using type two as well, around the 1070s, 1080s, 1090s, and type three used alternating layers of uh, of uh, big tablets, like right here. You can see. Um, Whereas type four used alternating layers of uh, medium tablets. Oops, right there. And some smaller tablets. And these uh, two were not meant to be for display, but the, they were designed to, to hold a plastered surface of mud, so they were uh, covered over with plaster. Now, finally, uh, there was the McElmo type, and these walls were built with a thin inner core of rubble and a real thick out of veneer of uh, larger bricks or rocks. Veneer means surface area. This was a styling that either was learned from the Mesa Verde people and imitated by the Chaco or Mesa Verde people themselves, uh, or, the, uh, or the, maybe the Chaco, maybe what it was is the Mesa Verde people were getting involved with those of the Chaco culture. We know that's for sure in the upper uh, um, uh, part of the region of the San Juan Basin. It dates to the early 1100s, and a selection of great house ruins at Chaco, such as King Kletso, used this style. And finally, um, we're going to look at the Aztec ruins near the city of Aztec. This is in the northern San Juan Basin. It's a great house pueblo, abandoned at the close of the Chaco culture. Its inhabitants from Mesa Verde moved in and modified many of the walls. In this photo, you can see a decorative uh, dark green band and ordinary large blocks of McElmo masonry style positioned on top of prior type 4 done by the Chaco people. See? When archaeologists talk about ancient people, it's their pottery that provides the intimacy of their daily lives. Pottery is tied to food production and consumption as well as the human accomplishment and interest in their arts. The distinctive style of pottery for the ancient people of Chaco during their classic period is the one the experts call Chaco black on white. Really the white looks grayish white. Um, let me show you this. Cooking vessels. They were mostly dark earth tones and they had corrugated outer surfaces and looked relatively ugly compared to the black on white serving ware. The obvious fascination with the Chaco black on white pottery is the geometric designs. It's likely that the designs were aesthetic, that is, they were done not only for beauty, um, but also that there were some underlying belief systems guiding the designs. It was the religion holding astronomical and seasonal events in the, of the calendar in high regard, as well as reflections on life and the pathway to an afterlife. I could, uh, it could also be that they were just pretty. It wasn't um, just the Chaco that developed their art, but it was distinctive. And other Anasazi people had their own. By about the year 900, the people of Chaco had developed their trade network, and that included pottery to the extent that broken remains or intact pots, even, have been found throughout the entire region. In turn, much uh, imported pottery appears at Chaco, and because turquoise was found at the great houses, and was not mined in the San Juan Basin, a formalized trade network in semi-precious stones, uh, seashells from faraway oceans, 
and the pottery increased along with other general trade. Evidence of how far the trade network reached was found by, among other things, residue inside mugs. Researchers thought the Chaco people may have been drinking cocoa from down south in Mesoamerica, but when they analyzed 177 sherds for traces of chemicals from 18 different sites, including the Chaco culture sites and, uh, and Snake Town, a Hohokam site near Phoenix, uh, and sites in southwestern Colorado among the northern San Juan Anasazi, they found something else. Sure enough, they found evidence of cocoa. Yes from Mesoamerica, but also a highly caffeinated black drink called Ilex Vomitoria. Uh, this was a caffeinated drink made from uh, the Yaupan holly, Yaupan holly, a plant that grows uh, um, along the north side of the Gulf of Mexico, in other words today's American southern states. The trading relationship using perhaps both middlemen and traveling salesmen was quite extensive during the Chaco class, uh, classic period and this drink was used in rituals of men who fasted and then they drank a lot of black drink and then they barfed. Blech! These purging rituals helped stimulate trance-like states and was uh, practiced by the ancient Indians of Mississippi and Illinois known as the Cahokia people. Remember about that, Cahokia. Pueblo Bonito had a ruling elite, not to the level of a nation state, but they had some kind of a hierarchy, and that was like those of other advancing Neolithic societies that had preceded them thousands of years before in the Middle East. Researchers have found that they ruled for 330 years, from AD 800 to 1130. And unlike typical burials, these were found in the oldest part of Pueblo Bonito inside the Pueblo in a low-level room called Room 33 by the archaeologists. Fourteen skeletons of these venerated elitists were found in Pueblo Bonito, and DNA tests on the skeletons showed them to be relatives uh, related to a matrilineal or motherly lineage. They were venerated as evidenced by the jewelry and artifacts that were buried with them. I'd like to show it to you, or them to you, I should say. One of the dead was a man in his 40s, and he was killed by some blow to the head. The ancients buried him with 11,000 turquoise beads, 3,300 shell beads, and other shells from the Gulf of California, including a conch shell a trumpet, uh, you can see it on the photo above, uh, let's see, right here. Um, and uh, this was uh, the richest burial in the southwest up to that time. On top of him was some sand and another man buried with over 5,800 pieces of turquoise. And then there was more sand and then a floor of wooden planks. And then on top of that was more sand and 12 more people were buried. So, analysis of isotopes of teeth of 61 people buried in Pueblo Bonito showed they grew up eating food and drinking water either from Chaco Canyon itself or nearby areas to the south. The remains of some of the individuals had signs of disease such as the lung disease, uh, tuberculosis, and uh, syphilis, which is a bacterial infection uh, that's spread by sexual contact and it eventually damages uh, bones and joints. Now finally, three individuals were showed, um, uh, were uncovered, uh, and they had six toes. Several plastered walls at Pueblo Bonito showed these, uh, and, and petroglyphs, they showed these peculiar, mm, uh, well, handprints and footprints with six digits and uh, seven ancient sandals or were made uh, to accommodate six-toed people and those were found as well. Some Mesoamerican cultures depicted gods with six toes. At Pueblo Bonito one of the three individuals found with six digits had a, an elaborate grave so it appears that the people of Chaco regarded these people as special. Another odd feature discovered by researchers was a road network 
they, they used the techniques of remote sensing, that, that is the researchers, which uh, used aircraft or satellites to take photos. And then they uh, performed analysis of the kind of light that we can't see reflecting back off of disturbed ground surfaces. Using these techniques, they found a road system constructed after the year AD 1050. Some appear to have been used more for religious pilgrimage and as part of uh, tying together the widely scattered uh, great house settlements as part of a political function, uh, more than for uh, an economic function, function I would say, uh, like trade and, and pottery. The roads are very straight, the rocks cleared away from 30 feet wide paths and even earth uh, filling to bridge irregularities in the terrain. Archaeologists found uh, waste stop stations, which were little stone houses. Uh, in one case, there's a hill with charcoal on top. Uh, the, clearly, it was some kind of a signaling hill. Some roads are not longer than just a few miles, while others, like the one I'm going to show you next, were very long. Let's go back to seeing the setting of the San Juan Basin and how the Chaco complex fits in it. Uh, so. We zoom in to uh, Pueblo Bonito, and that's the largest of them all, right in the center of the complex. Now let's travel to the northern height above Chaco Canyon. There's a smaller great house ruin called Pueblo Alto, Pueblo Alto, or High Village. From the main Chaco culture site of Pueblo Alto, a double lane road, each 30 feet wide, takes a rigidly straight path north for 31.4 miles. It has two bends along it, and it's, at its end, it's, uh, there's a vast and beautiful badland area, today called uh, Coots Canyon. Coots Canyon. The road just ends there, at the rim, and nearby on a small promontory is thought to be a shrine. As you saw, the Great North Road, which the scholars call it, has no apparent purpose. It's just going north for 31.4 miles. Today it's unnoticeable. If it hadn't been for my use of a light green line, you, you wouldn't have been able to see it. But the point of this road became apparent when scholars realized that it was a pilgrimage route. Clues came from ethnographic research into traditional belief systems of the Pueblo Indians, uh, that uh, lived in more modern times, uh, the, the uh, beliefs that they held about the afterlife. And it was believed that the spirits of the dead went north to the afterlife. Travelers replicated this on their journey to the shrine at the edge of Coots Canyon, obviously. They then journeyed back to the starting point, making almost 63 miles of travel. And that's a real pilgrimage. Journey to a place, journey back, and then sacrifice something such as break pottery and all the while reenact what they believe to be a journey of the of their dead loved ones uh, into the afterlife it dealt with loss grief uh, compulsion to sacrifice and it did it in an organized way which is what the major accomplishment of religion is turquoise is a copper and aluminum phosphate mineral copper and aluminum phosphate. It was highly prized as jewelry by the people of Chaco and also by the Indians of Mesoamerica, that is today's Mexico. However, the Chaco clearly had to import it because that semi-precious gemstone is not found in the San Juan Basin. Uh, on the map at left you can see the closest supply was a place south of Santa Fe, New Mexico called Cerrios, Cerrios, marked Cerrios Hills on this map. Other closest sources are in today's state of Colorado and further afield sources would have come from today's state of Sonora and Nevada. Uh, now think of this. Without machine tools, this semi-precious gem has to be drilled and fractured and each piece shaped by hand on an abrasive surface. Um, so. To drill holes, a pump drill was used that had a malacate or spindle whirl. 
with a little set of uh, uh, strings and uh, a pumper paddle wheel or paddle uh, board and uh, this drill used a hard non-metallic point where you could daub on with your finger a slurry of water in sand or mud and you make that point abrasive um, the point could be made out of uh, a cactus spine uh, or some other kind of hard wood or it could be made out of uh, uh, some kind of rock uh, such as obsidian or something the result of all that long tedious task are beads that were you were able to string together um, now an example are these jewels of the ruling elite of Chaco there were other semi-precious gems included such as black jet which was really just hard hard coal both can be seen in the unusual black frog artifact found at Pueblo Bonito the use and uh, of a turquoise and the trade in it um, showed up in civilizations as far to the south at, uh, at who had an influence over the people of Chaco they were in Mesoamerica, Mesoamerica being uh, today's Mexico and Central America. The scarlet macaw is a kind of bird dwelling in the tropics of Mesoamerica and uh, valued by the Indians living there. The lure was the colored feathers in red, yellow, green, and blue. Uh, not so much green but red, yellow, and blue were the more uh, well-known colors that were used. And these colors were associated with directions that in turn were part of a religious belief system. Uh, Chaco Canyon is nowhere near the tropical habitat of the macaw, and yet they were transported north through a trade network. It's likely that the ones most likely to survive such a long journey would have been young macaws, but it's still not easy to transport them. One particular internment of dead macaws at Chaco revealed at least three waves dated to within the periods displayed on the screen. Now, why would they have gone to such trouble? The answer is likely that they were made to be symbols of the cosmos, symbols that reinforced the religion. The religion was tied in to the ruling hierarchy of uh, Chaco Canyon. The trade in macaws further hints that at least there was a distant influence by the people of Mesoamerica on Chaco. Um, I should probably elaborate on this further about the purpose of macaws. Although these birds at Chaco Canyon date to the 9, 10, and 1100s, they show up in New Mexico much later in time and they are still highly prized by the Pueblo Indians uh, in the 1930s for their quasi-human quality. Um, that is, they can imitate human speech. It, for example, in the 1930s at the Pueblo of Zuni, one eyewitness described a caged macaw that could speak a few words in the Zuni language and uh, knew the names of several people and would recognize them. Um, uh, at a, at a, a Hopi archaeological site northwest of Zuni, but closer to those of the, of the Hopi land, uh, there were scarlet macaws uh, were found on a mural painting at a ruined pueblo called Aguatovi, which was destroyed in the year 1700. The pueblos have a belief system in which directions play an important role in dances and the invocation of blessings believed to come from the up from the earth and then from the, the four directions towards a pueblo. Now each direction has a theme color. For the Tewa, the north was blue. For the west, it was uh, um, yellow. For the south, it was uh, red. And for the east, it was white. Now, in some belief systems, red orange material represents the south or the nadir, which means the direction, uh, the direct southward position, or straight down. In these religious belief, uh, systems, magical properties were associated with the directions and they invoked them when say uh, you wanted it to rain for example. Um, for this reason macaw feathers were used on costumes, masks and prayer sticks as part of prayers to deities. And Of course um, they were more common among people in Mesoamerica 
such as the Maya, the Toltec, and the Aztec. The Pueblo of Peñasco Blanco, remember that one in Chaco Canyon, is built on a mesa top at the western end of the canyon. But the canyon itself, below the Pueblo, there's this peculiar cliff overhang forming a kind of small ceiling upon which is a pictogram. Uh, as it was determined that the Chaco people were observing astronomical events, scholars realized that this particular pictogram was a record of an event of which the people of Chaco would have been an eyewitness to. On the 5th of July of the year 1054, a star exploded. It was seen by Chinese astronomers as well as Japanese, who called it a guest star, and a physician in Baghdad, today's Iraq, in Mesopotamia. Uh, because the Chinese astronomers, um, um, well, we know the date. And uh, there was this big star that suddenly exploded, and calculations determined that there would have been a, a crescent moon at the time. As you can see from the reconstructed view of the night sky shown at left, the pictogram at right is a sort of stylized version of the event. Now, what's with the hand? Well, from my own research into the Tewa Pueblo Indian language, there was a traditional name for a constellation of stars called Mang. Mang, meaning hand. Uh, I need some confirmation on the astronomy of that, but that may explain it. Now, the event uh, left evidence of itself uh, that you can see through a telescope. Basically, it's an explosion cloud called a nebula and within is a hidden pulsing body called a pulsar that gives off radio waves. So behold the Crab Nebula. The explosion that caused it created a star that you could see day and night for about three weeks. Let me take you now to Wupatki, Wupatki, a Pueblo ruin in today's north central state of Arizona. The people who built this Pueblo were the Sinagua people and the Cayenta Anasazi, or Cayenta Anasazi. They carried on a trading relationship with the Chaco people and in a larger network had access to trade items like shells from the still faraway Pacific Ocean. Upatki is a name in the Hopi Pueblo language meaning tall house. This is an example of an Anasazi boom town. The reason was that nearby a volcano erupted and spread ash all over the orange-red landscape. This was an effusive lava event called today uh, Sunset Crater and it put 800 square miles into new agricultural potential because it enriched the soil and helped it hold moisture better. This triggered a land rush like a gold rush. Hundreds of Anasazi showed up and staked claims and built villages in the area taking advantage of rainwater and the cinder mulch and uh, start dry farming uh, maize and squash. According to dating techniques using old timbers and trees called dendrochronology, a researcher determined that the eruption happened in AD 1064 and every high schooler in Arizona had to learn that year. A new study by researchers, however, presented that uh, Sunset Crater spewed out phosphorus for a few weeks around the late fall or winter of 1085. That stuff is a great fertilizer. They suggested that in 1064 something did impact the trees, but it was in 1085 that the land was peppered with goodness. For this reason, I want you to remember AD 1085 as the year of the eruption of Sunset Crater. Researchers often revisit ideas and interpretations previously held that uh, keeps science fresh and they publish new information refuting previous assumptions. The article this came from is entitled AD 1064 No More? Question mark. A Multidisciplinary Reevaluation of the Date of the Eruption of Sunset Crater in, uh, uh, of course, in northern Arizona. Anyway, the farming boom led to a population boom and associated economic and cultural opportunity. But after 140 years, the place was abandoned due to lack of rain. Now let's revisit the cliff overhang below uh, Pueblo Peñasco Blanco where the Crab Nebula supernova was recorded. On a vertical wall, 
right by it is a faded pictogram of some flaming flying ball. Scholars believe that this is another celestial event of even greater worldwide fame than the supernova. It's the AD 1066 uh, Halley's Comet or Halley's Comet, depending on pronunciation. Uh, <clears throat> the Chinese recorded this, as did the people of England. Um, let me show you this one. This is the Bu Tapestry. Um, the year 1066 was an especially good year for the, its brightness in the sky and is portrayed on this embroidered textile. Uh, made originally in England and showing that the thing zooms, well, Halley's Comet zooms in orbit uh, around the Sun every 75 years. And so back in 1986, um, this is what it looked like. It was rather faded compared to the one that came by nine years later called Comet Hale-Bopp, but you can get an idea about the Halley's Comet with, that it was very bright and dramatic to the Chaco Anasazi. Comets are basically uh, snowy dirt balls that release gas and dust and uh, they orbit the sun and they pass Earth and get closer to the sun. They make a bright head and tail and it releases water, uh, carbon monoxide and methane. Let me uh, reintroduce you to the Fajada Butte and its astronomical Sun Dagger Calendar site. It's a very prominent feature at the wide part of Chanco Canyon. At the upper tier on the uppermost cliff is a curious set of uh, three flat, thin, heavy set of sandstone slabs set tilted and upright against the cliff. This was part of a solar and lunar timepiece developed by the Chaco culture. For those of you who have not taken geography or cosmology or astronomy or any of those, I will keep what I'm about to say as simple to understand as possible. The sun and moon rise at different locations along the horizon and the angle of how they transit the sky changes throughout the year. For the sun, it's according to the season, completed in a year. Firstly, in New Mexico, the sun in winter rises far south uh, on the horizon and transits the sky down low making our days short. Secondly, in summer the sun is far north on the horizon and transits the sky really up high making our, day, our, our days long. And thirdly, on the first day of spring or fall the sun rises and sets to the uh, east to west and it gives us a, an even 12 hour day and 12 hour night at least here in New Mexico. Now shown in the photo is a petroglyph that served as a calendar on the cliff face of a butte called uh, the Sun Dagger. It used those specially placed rock slabs that uh, were on the, leaning against the cliff face that allows a dagger of sunlight to point through a swirly symbol. On the right is how it points to its center at high noon on June 21st every year for hundreds of years. That's what we call it today, the first day of summer. On the left is the portrayal of December 21st, the first day of winter. Uh, when instead of a single dagger, it's two brackets of light, bracketing the spiral. Um, this sun dagger also uses the position of the sun to mark the first day of spring or fall and uh, changes in the moon over a 19 year cycle. For the moon, it's a cycle uh, lasting really 18.6 years, almost the 19 I just mentioned. The moon rises and sets within what appears to us as movement along the horizon. Um, sages among the ancient people noticed changes over time about where the moon rose and set. and They passed this information down the generations and other sages noticed a pattern of predictability. Let me get to this here. There we go. All right. So um, let me uh, try to illustrate this for you with a short movie from the Chaco Canyon Solstice Project. Uh, sages later took this information 
about what it was observed to construct a calendar that looks like a swirly petroglyph marking a cycle of 19 and rocks that cast shadows on it. Um, as you can see, the moon does not rise in the same place and the shadow moves. See? So, a major lunar standstill is when the moon will rise and set more northerly and about two weeks later more southerly and transit uh, higher in the sky than ever. About two weeks later it will rise and set lower than ever. Here. Then, 9.3 years later, the moon will rise and set on the horizon the least of those extremes here and here and transit the sky lower than ever then it takes 9.3 years to go back to where it was to the major here and here um, so there are nine swirlies on the spiral count them one two three four five six seven eight nine and uh, they mark each year that the moon changes position. Some sages used this knowledge about the sun and moon and the calendar that they built to direct the religion and become powerful as they were part of the ruling elite who held a spell over the masses. The people they directed were disciplined. The elite used awe, wonder, and solemnity and certainly terror to direct what came next. These were not a people that had much in the way of instruments to mark directions, so they did it by using natural rock formations at first and then deliberately set up rocks and petroglyphs. The sages got the idea to begin major building projects to honor the heavenly bodies and pay respect to these signs in the sky. They built buildings with walls and even windows angled towards the extremes of the rising and setting uh, moon and sun. The illustration at left is from the studies conducted by the Solstice Project. Shown are the buildings that marked the angles of the lunar minor standstill and the lunar major standstill. The cardinal directions of north, west, south and east and solar orientations of winter and summer solstices and the uh, equinoxes, that is, uh, the sun that marking the beginning of spring and fall. Let me brief you show, um, show you on Google Earth another peculiar network. Those lunar standstills and cardinal directions were marked by the great houses themselves where they were placed on the landscape. As you can see here, they built many pueblos according to a plan in which one great house was in alignment with another. They probably used people and torches or bonfires in the night to survey lines over many miles and then constructed their building complexes according to those lines of moonrise and moonset for the lunar standstills. Uh, shown here in purple and in uh, uh, blue. Now zooming in to the immediate area around uh, Pueblo Bonito, I'm going to do that right here now you can see how the noontime sun and the or the north star uh, and the spring and fall equinoxes uh, symbolized here by an orange line uh, are marked by the alignment of the great houses on the landscape in this case Pueblo Alto and Tsinkletsin are in alignment for north and south and a small ruin here called uh, it's a small great house called a New Pueblo Alto and here past Pueblo Bonito is Casa Rinconada in alignment with it and then you can see the corner wall of Pueblo Bonito I'm gonna zoom into it so you can get a better view right here is in alignment with the Great Kiva uh, Chetroquetl right here and alignments like this I'm only showing you a few of them there's uh, several more that aren't included in this particular uh, diagram or overlay on Google Earth but this is how uh, the uh, the people of Chaco were were going to extremes of 
using buildings to mark these uh, alignments on the landscape with their own great houses. Some Pueblo great houses were modified from prior creations, but for many of the great houses they were pre-planned and executed in large scale at once, but maintained and modified over time. They used the angles of the sun and moon as uh, magic angles that they reproduced for the floor plan of each great house. Scholars extracted the pattern of more or less eh, 23 degrees for the lunar minor standstill and 36 for the lunar major standstill. I'm rounding, of course. Then there are other alignments according to the north the, and to south and east to west, guided by the sun and the north star. Throughout the world, cultures that uh, observed celestial bodies and other aspects of nature um, uh, have the, grown their human knowledge simply by looking for patterns in nature. The key petroglyph that set off the modern day discovery about the talent for observation and celestial obsession of the Chaco Anasazi was the rock art with a spiral, a letter D, and an arrow pointing uh, to that spiral. The swirl design was found to be a solar calendar symbol. You will recall that Pueblo Bonito was overbuilt to have 800 maroons and uh, that's what the semicircular outline of the lazy letter D represents. Um, on uh, letter C, it's pointed out as letter C, the outline right here on this particular diagram. It comes from, a, a, from an article written by uh, Anna Sofar. Now, uh, the south wall shown as letter A right here, um, well, um, that conforms to Pueblo Bonito's alignment according to the east-west solar equinox shown here at the bottom of the screen right here at the very edge. Um, the center dividing wall uh, which is runs right up the middle of Pueblo Bonito right here is letter B right here. So uh, it is not only believed to serve as a separation wall between moieties that is the summer people living on one side and the winter people living on the other but also as an alignment to the noontime sun, the noon meridian, which is right up on the sky over us uh, usually during the summer. Finally, the letter D right here, the center line, uh, there's a little peck right there, a little drill hole. Uh, that is believed to be the great Kiva um, uh, on the plaza of, of Pueblo Bonito, symbolized by a drill hole. The sages and elite of Chaco didn't just reserve the megalomania of building only to the main complex at Chaco Canyon. Great houses were commissioned all over the San Juan Basin and beyond. 86 direct miles to the north and east was a place where they built a great, great house and great kiva upon a high and narrow summit called in Spanish La Piedra Parada or the Standing Rock. It's what the archaeologists call a Chaco outlier. Located in today's state of Colorado, uh, aside from its Spanish name La Piedra Parada, it's also known by the name of Chimney Rock and is situated east of the city of Durango near the small town of Piedra. It was built for the occasion of the major lunar standstill of AD 1076 and so there is another year I want you to remember. 1076. So, once in an 18.6 year cycle, almost 19, the moon rises between these natural pillars as seen from the Great Kiva within the Great House Pueblo upon the ridge of Chimney Rock Summit. Uh, this occasion was on December 26th of 2004. I'm going to take occasion to show it to you way up here in the north, Farmington, just inside the the boundary with Colorado. I'm zooming in here, zooming in, zooming in, zooming in, zooming in. It's a place you can visit. There's even an automobile uh, road all the way up in a parking lot right here. You will see that this ridge is quite high 
in elevation. The parking lot itself is 7,400, over 7,400 feet in elevation. Then there's a walking trail that comes to the uh, great house itself. And then this is what the view is towards the, the ridge, towards the north and west from here. doesn't show up well because of the way the, it, the photograph is draped over this model of a landscape but uh, it replicates what I just showed you on the slide here these two big columns of rock the experts are calling this next one I want to show you by the Spanish name Piedra del Sol Piedra del Sol meaning rock of the sun this is a boulder located in Chaco Canyon and features a spiral petroglyph that is in line with a gap in the cliff above, uh, shown right here, um, through which the sunshine pierces through every June 21st summer solstice. Scholars say that a total solar eclipse event occurred on July the 11th, 1097, and that's where the the, uh, the the moon completely covers the sun and this rock and its solar observation point was used by an eyewitness to document uh, unusual flares right here uh, that raged out of the sun's corona on that occasion Venus would have been visible in the sky um, it went dark uh, uh, the sky that is and uh, the occasion to peck a, a portrayal of it uh, on the petroglyph here in the mid-center. Uh, this is the portrayal of the sun itself. Now perhaps they uh, played flutes when the solstice occurred. There are Kolkopelli flute players pecked into that rock as well. Changes in Chaco society were happening. Prolonged drought was weakening the credibility of the ceremonies, there were social tensions, and perhaps uh, out migrations of people as well. To the people of Chaco, uh, they were probably superstitious and maybe thought it, it was a bad omen. Someone took the time to record it right here, again, this portrayal right here. The countdown was on. They didn't know it yet, but in about 43 to 53 more years, the Chaco culture would completely collapse. So I want you to remember the year AD 1097, the year of the solar eclipse and the solar mass ejection. Mesoamerica is today's southern Mexico and Central America. True civilizations had arisen there and extended an influence north to the Anasazi. So let's go back briefly to that ruin called Hutpatki in today's state of Arizona. Uh, and I'll also take you to Phoenix and to take you to Chihuahua, Mexico. There is this particular ball court at Hutpatki. It's replicated uh, by those of the Hohokam in, the, in the, today's area of uh, Phoenix, Arizona, and another one at Paquimé, Chihuahua, near the city of uh, Casas Grandes, Chihuahua, of the Mogollon people. This court of Wutpatki is, uh, in Arizona is 78 by 102 feet, and it shows an influence in this unusual sporting event that originated with the Olmec of Mexico and the Maya of Guatemala, of today's southern Mexico also. The game was meant uh, as, a, as a religious devotion, uh, a reenactment, to reenact a mythological story. Uh, and so the game was religious in nature, but made its way yet all the way north to uh, north uh, central Arizona. Trade and cultural ideas from city-states in Mesoamerica came north influencing the Mogollon, the Hohokam, and the Anasazi of the Chaco culture. So, um, for example, found among the architecture of the Mogollon and the Anasazi are the, these peculiar T-shaped doors. Uh, this one is an unusually large one at Pueblo Bonito in Chaco Canyon that you can visit as part of a self-guided tour. Um, Another example we dealt with earlier is the presence of live macaws, a bird with colorful feathers used in the religious cosmology of the Anasazi. And then there's the turquoise. 
These examples were found at Pueblo Bonito and show not only procurement from distant mines, but turquoise found uh, its way all the way to Mesoamerica from the American Southwest El Norte, which shows that there was a distant influence uh, tra uh, and trade uh, with the Pueblo Indians, at least through surrogates, if not directly. This influence will continue during the Pueblo III and Pueblo IV periods. Notice that advancing societies in Mesoamerica as far afield as Tula and La Quemada existed at the same time as Chaco. Poor health and violence played destructive roles in Anasazi societies. I need to caution you that some of the subjects are disturbing and this presentation is intended to familiarize you with the darker side to the cultures and people of the time that draw contrast between human achievement and folly that's so persistent to all human existence and that is what history deals with. At left is a skull of an infant from Pueblo Bonito dated to after 950. This is a disease that causes bones to be porous like leavened bread. It's currently thought to be the result of a vitamin B12 deficiency in the diet of infants due uh, in turn from the mothers lacking meat to eat and uh, life in unsanitary conditions causing diarrheal diseases, causing nutrient loss, and, um, and it resulted in high rates of infant mortality. It was prior to this thought to be corn anemia, but now they think it's just vitamin D, B12 deficiency. So during a drought, these problems were common and could also be caused by warfare and uh, socio-economic collapse. So remember the name porotic hyperostosis. Porotic hyperostosis. Evidence indicates that the Anasazi performed raids, um, which involved violent invasion of other people to capture men, women, and children as slaves. This was a strategy to increase their population, compete better with other groups for resources, and increase their productivity. They made these slaves work the cornfields, in other words. An example of this uh, occurrence during this time is seen at an archaeological excavation of a large multi room village community at the La Plata Valley near Farmington, New Mexico, where 60% of the females and 23% of the males showed that while they were alive, they had been hit on, on, on the head pretty hard. These were fractures to the skull that had healed. The skeletons um, bearing the healed injuries were receiving beatings, and it showed that they were worked hard daily. The skeletons of two females featured here were from eh, 30 to 35 years old and were not buried carefully with grave goods for the afterlife, as was typical, but thrown rather haphazardly into a pit house. It, it was not servitude with the goodwill of the slave, but rather brutal slavery, uh, born and, and targeting mostly the women in this particular uh, settlement, which could indicate that these were women that had been captured in a raid uh, next, we come to Mesa Verde. At the conclusion of Pueblo II, violence at Mesa Verde was found to have spiked in one of the studies. In two distinct periods, that being from uh, the year 1060 to 1100, and then from 1140 to 1180. And these were two 40-year periods interrupted by a 40-year period. The evidence was obtained by analysis of arm and head injuries on skeletons uh, dating to those times. Meanwhile, in the Mississippi Valley and Mesoamerica, the year 1150 was spelling out doom. Give or take a decade, this is the time when Tula in Mexico fell. The Cahokia people, originators of the black drink from Illinois, went to, into decline. The Hohokam of today's Phoenix, they just fell apart. And our favorite subject culture, the Chaco, they experienced a crash and came to an end. There's uh, evidence that the great houses and the great kivas of Chaco Canyon were deliberately dismantled and burned at this time. So as we address these topics, 
just keep in mind um, that uh, uh, they've gone, uh, uh, some subjects have gone somewhat ignored. And we, what we know now does not mean that all the people that are the subject of this study uh, engage in the kind of behaviors that you are seeing any more than for example of uh, let's say in the future they would judge our culture by uh, oh I don't know uh, the demographics of people who are in the state pen for example the, you have to realize that there are there's variety to every culture nevertheless there is widespread uh, appearance of some of these strange things that I'm about to show you this final subject needs to be addressed it's gone ignored due to the sensitivities and implications that are involved. So we'll never know enough about what happened, but based on tedious study and compelling evidence, many Anasazi sites and Chaco sites in particular had human remains showing evidence of cannibalism. Chaco rose from AD 900 and crashed by 1150. The empire of the Toltecs, they lasted from 800 to 1100, and they overlapped with that of Chaco. And then uh, having addressed the, the distant uh, cultural influence, we can see that simultaneous with the society of Chaco, the Toltec engaged in human sacrifice and cannibalism as part of a socio-political and ideological complex. So let me explain that using the framework provided by the late uh, Christy G. Turner II of Arizona State University. Here he's shown uh, he's received lots of criticism uh, but he was the one who studied many human remains and theorized that cannibalism might have been used by a powerful elite at Chaco Canyon as a form of social control. So it established order uh, and it later begat chaos. And there's different kinds of cannibalism. Nutritional cannibalism, for example, is what people have done in desperation to alleviate persistent hunger and food shortage. Another purpose of cannibalism was to frighten and subjugate people. A group would not have to do it a lot to accomplish this goal. All that is, that's needed is for it to be a religious ritual to bring order to the world. Um, it would preserve the theocratic system of an elite class uh, and priests, uh, satisfy a religious belief in gods that need human sacrifice to keep the cosmos running, and if it's done for a desire to express power or take revenge, such as to keep the elite in power or retaliate against the challenges to that power, it helped dominate the masses and it crushed dissent. In conclusion, I want you to remember the particulars discussed in this presentation as follows. Canyon del Charco this is the sensible name of Chaco Canyon because it means pool or water hole and appears on an 1864 map this way. Uh, this is the original Spanish name uh, from which is derived today's Chaco Canyon. Lunar minor and lunar major standstills. The angles 35.7 and 22.9 degrees appear as part of the layout of major Chaco culture ruins and were based upon the observations of the moon over an 18.6 year cycle. That's a lot to remember, but just remember in general. You don't have to remember the detail of decimal points and all of this, but get the major uh, um, point of this um, definitions, that there were angles that were used in the layout of the Chaco cultural ruins because the moon made an almost 19 year cycle and they observed enough to derive uh, important angles for, from that observation. Then there's the sun dagger and the that's the name the scholars gave to this kind of a solar and lunar timepiece developed by the Chaco culture uh, on Fajada Butte and it marked the yearly solstices, equinoxes and the moon cycles, the 19, well 18.6 year moon cycle at Chaco and it was used for agricultural and likely religious purposes. So once again, Cañón del Charco, shown here on the 1864 map, <clears throat> the lunar major and lunar minor, minor standstills that created the angles that they used in buildings, and the uh, sun dagger. And that is 
portrayed here on Fahada Butte in this photograph. Now, please remember the Great North Road from the main Chaco culture site of Pueblo Alto, a pathway for death pilgrimage rituals, takes this rigidly straight 30 foot wide path for 31.4 miles to clay badlands. Pilgrims would go and then they would come back. And that is this shown on Google Earth. Then there's the Mesoamerican connection. So items such as macaw skeletons, and there were ball courts at Putpatki, T shaped doors on buildings throughout the southwest, turquoise trade, and then the cultural fallout from the fall of uh, Tula of the Toltecs in Mexico in AD 1150 all suggest that there was a Mesoamerican connection with the Chaco culture. And then there's this, a disease called porotic hyperostosis, a condition where a lack of foods of animal origin, deficiency of B, vitamin B12, or diarrheal diseases due to warfare show up on the bones of Anasazi people. Remember the following years. So 1054, this is the year of pictogram made by the Anasazi below Pueblo Peñasco Blanco in Chaco Canyon is believed to memorialize an exploding star called the Crab Nebula Supernova, visible day and night for three weeks. 1085, the eruption of Sunset Crater leading to the founding of Wupatki. Uh, you may Google it and you will find references to 1064, but that is old and this is the new research. 1066, Halley's Comet, shown as part of a dire pictogram that was made by the Anasazi below Pueblo Peñasco. Uh, so it's on the vertical wall below the Crab Nebula Supernova pictograph. 1066. 1076, 10 years later, this is the major lunar standstill recorded by the building of a great kiva and great house on the top of Chimney Rock, also known as La Piedra Parada, in what is today southern Colorado. 1097, that is the year of the solar eclipse and solar mass ejection uh, portrayed on a boulder in Chaco Canyon that was uh, itself a record and, a, uh, and an observatory for signs in the heaven. This concludes Pueblo II period culture, uh, focusing mostly on the Chaco Canyon uh, culture. Thank you.